Hello, YouTube. Hello to all our friends and folks that follow us. Uh, Going to get in today to some history, boxing history, <clears throat> that I have really committed to memory up here. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a lot of vague things. Um, and when I tell you I want to get into some boxing history with you, I want to get into some real boxing history with you. Not what Ring Magazine editors or other folks have portrayed over the years or Howard Cosell. Uh, ended up changing and saying during the 1970s when Muhammad Ali had his huge resurgence and rather a, resur a resurgence or, or a coming to the populace loving Muhammad Ali. So we're going to go back just a little bit here. Uh, to make reference of some of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about quite a few things. Uh, we're going to talk about um, Ali, Sonny, Liston, one, which would be Cassius Clay, Sonny, Liston, one, and two. Uh, of course, after the second fight, uh, Cassius Clay uh, changed his name to the beloved Muhammad Ali that we all know. But we're gonna we're gonna get real here, and, and most of what I tell you is what I either saw with my own eyes, or shortly I saw uh, relative within a year or two, two or four, five maybe tops after something happened, uh, and what every one of the day. Uh, within those times that did see these things, even if I didn't see them, uh, what it, the general consensus and what everybody thought and what everybody was saying. And uh, we're going to give some facts into it. And, and there's a lot of things I'm going to be talking to you about that even to this day in Sunny List and One or uh, List and Clay One and Two, uh, the FBI has tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pages of uh, documentation on investigation and what was going going on during the time of those two fights. And they still refuse to release the information. They released, I believe it was in 2018, uh, due to some type of whistleblower activity. Uh, released 300 pages of material, uh, but th there's at minimum tens to hundreds of thousands of more pages and, doc and documents uh, that they that they did have not released. So, uh, and, and there's always reasons. Um, there's always reasons, and we're going to discuss some. Or you'll. You'll be able to add two plus two and put it together in here somewhere. But I'm going to go a wee bit about a decade earlier with uh, uh, the fight of Rocky Marciano and Jersey Joe Walcott won the first fight, uh, and and then we're going to come up with we're going to get off that fight and then we're going to get on. Uh, the List and Ali fights. Uh, in 19, I believe it was 1951, uh, Rocky Marciano challenged Jersey Joe Walcott for the heavyweight championship of the world. Jersey Joe was champion. Uh, we we like Jersey Joe a whole lot. He was a, he was a good champion. Uh, wasn't champion very for an ex he wasn't one of those champions that had a long air, but boy could that guy fight and he proved it fighting 
Joe Lewis very, very toughly two times uh, previous to him beating Azure Charles and winning the championship for himself. Jersey Joe was something else. Uh, but in Marciano, uh, Walcott won, where Marciano won the championship. Fights going along, it's to We all, everyone, uh, people that get into boxing history of, uh, with concerns to uh, the championships and them changing hands and things like this. Uh, this part is well told even to this day by old timers, uh, people older than me, of course, uh, that um, people in their 90s that were sitting there would tell you this. Um, maybe there's some kids that, that, that maybe they're in their 80s that would see that fight. That was a long time ago. Yeah, 70 years ago. So, yeah, a long time ago. But in that fight that, you, that, that rarely gets brought up when they talk about that fight, um, once you get past the actual fight itself, which showed Walcott handily, in my opinion, beating Marciana up to, I believe it was the 10th round, uh, maybe the 9th round. Um, Marciana catches him and clocks him, and Walcott's just out. He is out like a light. Uh, but earlier in that fight, Marciano's camp was complaining and flipping out and going crazy. Look at Walcott, and he's just yelling at the referee, and the referee's yelling back at the trainer for Marciano, saying, this is my ring, you get the hell back in the corner. Um, and just yelling and flipping out and going literally ballistic in between rounds uh, that the Walcott camp had got something in Marciano's eyes. So that happened just real boom sporadically. And uh, the announcers immediately go to, oh, that must be some liniment in this guy's eye. You know, some liniment. Uh, or something they put on Walcott's cut <coughs> because Walcott was cut around one of the eyes and he was cut pretty good, he was bleeding pretty good. And you have to keep in mind back then, hell, you could sit and put Vicks Vapor Rub on somebody. I mean, it was almost an unlimited capacity. Now today, uh, there's a couple of certain products that you can use on uh, on cuts. Uh, I, I won't bore you with all the specifics in that. There's a couple of different products and they work really well, but the, the thing about these products is, is when they get on the gloves or somebody's up or it won't get in the other guy's eyes and, and, and harm their vision during the fight. So, anyway, I wanted to say that because in uh, Ali, list in one, uh, there was a lot of controversy over it. Something's got in Ali's eyes. But you go back to 1951 and you'll see a Rocky Marciana doing this and can't see... Uh, just like Ali was. So, nothing very controversial there. And uh, this ain't going to be an Ali bashing session, by the way. Uh, I don't believe the truth is ever a bashing session. So, uh, but now we're going to move up to, uh, well, we're going to talk briefly about the trials that Sonny Liston had to go through. Folks, back in that day and time, uh, in the late 50s, mid and late 50s, when Liston was coming up, 
Um, it was not common at all for a fighter to have to have 50 fights before he'd get a crack at a championship. Liston had to have, I believe, had 50 fights before he got a crack at the championship. And, of course, he won it when he when he got that first chance at it. Uh, won it handily. And uh, won it handily again in the rematch. Now we're going to get into what was the flavor of the day, what was really going on, what were real boxing people saying about the mess and all of this from this from this point forward. Now we're not talking in a fan aspect. Uh, Y'all call them fanboys now. We're not talking about the mentality of what those folks were saying. We're talking about what boxing people were really saying. Uh, and that meant a lot more in yesteryear than it does today. Uh, but we had uh, Liston Clay one, and uh, I, uh, I know factually from uh, all, the, all, all the information that we have and I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Yeah, Willie Reddish was training, uh, and I'm sure that name's correct. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was Willie Reddish. I'm terrible with these names. But he was training Liston, and he even said Liston didn't train hardly well at all for that fight against Ali, that uh, the the odds were heavily stacked against the young Cassius Clay and what happened wasn't supposed to happen. So, uh, we, you can about put down as fact, uh, 100%, not 100%, believe it and know it, uh, that Liston got overwhelmed because he didn't train for this fight. He thought, well, I'm going to go in there and just literally bash this kid to pieces. This is, you know, my first real defense of the title that doesn't concern a rematch to the form, to a former champion or, or a match with a former champion, my first clean defense of this title, uh, I'm going to bash this kid to bits. And uh, that didn't happen. And I believe it was because Liston wasn't training. And uh, so... And there's all the speculation, listing cheated, and uh, it's amazing that from 1951 to 1964, that all of the boxing experts that were in media and vocal on the television, closed circuit or national television, uh, magazines and everything else, had forgotten the fact that... Uh, and there were other championship fights where the same thing happened. It was a repeated problem. These people putting these liniments and ointments on them and it getting in the other fighters' eyes. And not only was that a prominent thing that repeatedly happened, uh, they put these liniments on their fighter and it would get in their fighter's eyes. So that's the reason why we don't have all these products and things that they use today. Uh, so, and maybe it's a good thing, um, excuse me, but it seems like the whole entirety of the press who hated Sonny Liston, uh, that, and, and, and we're going to go in, I'm going to quickly tell you why that happened. Um, Sonny Liston was not a well, uh, spoken guy. I believe he was really intelligent, but. He had zero academic learning. I mean zero, folks. He couldn't read or write. Um, he talked uh, Alabama, South Georgia, Arkansas, Mississippi type farm talk. And the press didn't like it. So they'd ask him questions and they'd give words in it. 
that he couldn't understand and he just wouldn't give them an answer. And that was the beginning. Hit, hit Liston's inability to understand a lot of the words that they were using with him and knowing full well that he couldn't read or write and he wasn't educated. Um, so really that's on the media's fault. That, that's on them. That's on them jackasses. Uh, they should have known better than that. So there started being a hostility there. And uh, there was other things. Sonny Liston beat up a cop. I mean, it's things that happened uh, and stuff. He was a great, he was a big intimidating man. And uh, he could give you a look and do that brow and just put you down, you know, just sink your heart to the bottom of your feet. Uh, but that, all that, all these things aside, uh, the press didn't like Sonny Liston. They always say Sonny didn't like, Sonny Liston did not like the press, but it was the other way around. They didn't give him a, a chance. They just didn't give him a chance. And it's as simple as that. Then you look around these assholes we got today, uh, is it any wonder? And they're actually, literally, the kids of kids of kids today. Uh, they're in a interwoven group, folks. Just think about that for a second. They're not all blood kin, but they're in an interwoven group. <coughs> so, uh, Clay won the fight, and he won that fight. And there was nobody on on the boxing streets or scenes that that, that really denied that. Um, Sonny pulled out. He said he had a hurt shoulder. Uh, turns out we know now, but we didn't know then. He was getting treatments for the left shoulder uh, even before he even went in to fight uh, Clay. So, but he got whooped, and he didn't train. So, and another interest is something I just forgot here. Would you, uh, this never gets said in any of these stories, and this will blow your mind. Do you know who the promoter was for Listing 1 and Listing 2? Angelo Dundee's brother. For those of you that don't know, Angelo Dundee was the trainer slash co-manager at moments in the time uh, of Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. So just think about that. You're, you're, you're the promoter and your brother's fighters fighting against this guy. So there's going to be some things possibilities of stuff being stacked against you already and it would be hurt unheard of today you know immediately every single one of you would be screaming oh my god this is corrupt this won't work out right and you and you would be right and it wouldn't and they'd do it right in front of your face the difference is is back then it was more subtle today they just do it right these things right in front of your face um but he lost, Liston lost the first fight. So Liston starts training like there ain't no tomorrow, getting ready to fight Clay again. They get a date set. I believe that, that, that this one was going to be in Boston Gardens in Boston, Massachusetts, if memory serves me correct. Didn't happen there. The fight was canceled. And, and this is another thing you're never taught about. They booked this huge, gigantic fight for uh, Listing Clay 2, and they book it in Boston Gardens that I, I believe held way more people than Madison Square Garden. Now that, you'd have to go look that up. Uh, it, so you got all these thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Uh, these tickets went on sale. I mean, it was sad. 
And then all of a sudden, there is what many were saying, and many still to this day believe, old timers, you just haven't been, young people haven't been told any different, and you don't know about it. Uh, you just know about the great Ali that was really born in the 70s uh, towards after the Vietnam War, or when we were pulling all our troops out. Because it turns out Ali was on the right side of history for that. And uh, we, we should have never went there without the commitment to fight the war. And 50,000 kids died on account of that. Ali was right on that. Damn straight he was right. He was on the right side of history with that too. Uh, but you got the second fight coming up. Uh, gonna give you another tidbit. Admitted out of Sugar Ray Leonard's own mouth. See, so all you have to do is look. So, I'm trying to give you little tidbits and piece all this together as we're going along. That these things had happened before or after. Uh, Duran beat Sugar Sugar Ray Leonard in 1980. And I believe it was early 81 they had a rematch, maybe January or February of 81. And Sugar Ray Leonard is like, I used my head. I used that the rematch clause, and I said, we got to fight now. we got to fight now. i got to push it, push it, push it. Because Duran uh, would go home and uh, back to the uh, uh, Panama, and gorge himself and would literally gain 150 or 200 pounds. So Sugar Ray Leonard just rushed him into the fight and he knew that there would not be enough time for Duran to get ready. And I'm not bashing Sugar Ray Leonard for that. He's come out and admitted that. It's been on many news shows and biography shows about Sugar Ray Leonard. He used his brain. Well, turns out uh, Clay's team for listing Clay too were using their brains a little bit too. Uh, there's a lot of people that don't even really believe that uh, Ali did get hernia surgery, but uh, everybody, and I'm not talking about some people, folks, everybody was like, I'm not talking about Deontay Wilder fans. And Tyson Fury's gloves, glove game. I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm saying everybody was like, what? And there were medical reports leaked from the hospital where uh, Cassius Clay went to get the surgery. And the doctors leaked it out. He didn't have to have this. This was elective. He could have fought with this all day long. So he had a, he had a type of a hernia. But it wasn't nothing. Uh, there's a lot of fighters fighting with hernias, even today, folks. And there's different severity in hernias. Trust me on that. There are people that go 40 and 50 years with a hernia. And, and there's some people that just go 40, 50, 60 years with a hernia and never just even get anything done about it. It's like more of an inconvenience than a pain thing. And uh, so that's what everybody was saying. They were saying, this damn kid and those effing Dundees and these dirty, rotten Italians and the mafia that are controlling this damn sport, F them. It was the general consensus by everybody. So uh, Liston was ready for the fight. And boom, had to put it off for, I forget how many, ever many more months. And Liston was a spent man at that time, in my opinion, because I do believe Liston was much older than his, uh, his birth date was not uh, May the 13th of 19, I believe, 34, 36 that he put down, uh, or 32. He was probably, or no, yeah, like 36. He was listing his his age at like 36. And 
Liston was probably closer to 45 at that time of that second fight. And, and that was the word on the street, too. And if you go back and you look at the fights and you listen to the commentating, they're all, he says he's 34. He says he's 32. He says he's 36. But nobody believes that. And they didn't. Nobody believed it. He was older. Uh, so anyway, um, the fi that fight was called off. Now, after it was called off, then Madison Square Garden in Massachusetts was like, this is some finagling, scheming mess here. We, we don't want this fight in Massachusetts. And then states left and right, New York, I mean, just almost everywhere, was like, uh-uh, we ain't having it here because they knew there was finagling when that fight was called off by what Ali did, what Cassius Clay did. And that was the talk on the town and the street, folks. All this other stuff was made up fairy tales. Fairy tales. So, uh, they ended up having it in Lewiston, Maine, uh, in a high school. They say high school, but I think it was like a semi-pro hockey rink uh, held a maximum of like 6,000 people. You know, for a return clause heavyweight championship fight like that. So everybody knew what the hell was going on at that time. Now, of course, now it's a whole different story. Everything's changed on that. And what you're hearing today is made up fantasy news, uh, a made up myth about Muhammad Ali, who was great, by the way, but a made up myth, mythological hero in him. Uh, and it's all horseshit. It is horseshit. And Burke Sugar, who I believe just recently died, uh, at least he can't run around here spreading lies no more. And uh, Larry Merchant, that little liar, uh, same mess. He's still at his lying, trashy self. And now we got the one, the, the one boy who's took it over. Uh, uh, I forget the boy's name, but he was... A, I had a brother, and the brother was actually killed by a former boxer. Uh, and I just can't remember the guy's name. But he's the guy running around as the authority on the sport now. Uh, when none of these guys are telling you the honest to God's truth, because th they never knew the truth. And uh, they don't want to know it. So... That second fight, um, you can tell, you know, it didn't even make it a minute and a half or the first round, I believe. Uh, you can tell Liston was going to hunt him down and pop him. And as soon as that punch hit, and uh, newsflash, the phantom punch. All right. If the phantom punch was really not a phantom punch, why was Jack Dempsey saying, hey, something ain't right here? Why was Rocky Marciano tooting the same thing? And why was uh, Howard Cosell, who was like that, and did a variety show and had Ali on there all the time, two peas in a pod? Uh During Liston's last televised fight, when he was fighting Leo, Leo Dis Martin, uh, Howard Cosell on the pre-show right before the fight starts, and you can go watch it on YouTube, is, oh my God, there was something wrong in Lewiston, Maine, and there was something wrong with those two clay fights back in the years. Now, this was 1969, before Ali made his famous comeback, and him and Ali and Howard Cosell and the media had a fell in love with one another, see. And the truth got suppressed and pushed down. Uh, but 
Cosell's like, no, man, I don't want to get into all that, but we all know something's wrong. You know, with the Phantom Punch and all that, everybody knew something was wrong there. Everybody. Everybody. That's why no, no big uh, state uh, with a good athletic commission, including Nevada, with California, New York, Florida, uh, Massachusetts, or Illinois, or any of these places, they wouldn't take that fight. They were, hell no. We know what the Dundies are up to. We know what this deal is. Everybody knew it was an open secret, see? And nobody ever talks about it today. All you young people are going to, the greatest, the greatest, the greatest. And, you, and, and you're ignorant. I don't mean that offensive to you, but you just simply don't know nothing because nobody's told you anything. There's a lot of old trainers, including Teddy Atlas, uh, that run around here and won't tell you the truth, but knows the truth too. And he knows the truth. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, Custy Amato told him the truth. And you know he did. You know he did. And you go back to real old interviews with Custy Amato, and he's like, there's no way that damn guy, uh, Cassius Clay, could have beat him. Fair, square deal. And it's certainly not a second time. You know, we can see getting... Getting faked out and fooled to somebody's strength and speed to one time, but that wouldn't have never happened again. And then all of a sudden, uh, Custy Amato's on ABC Wild World of Sports in the famous clip uh, where he's really shadow boxing with Ali and they're talking and conversing and, you know, get put in bed with the media, make a little bit of money, and keep your mouth shut. Go along with the plan. He's the greatest. So that, that's a lot of been what's happened. All right. So for years, uh, Angelo Dundee's brother um, uh, promoted Ali fights. It started really getting questioned more big. So what do they do? They go create another sub company. That is Angelo Dundee and his brother's company, and that company starts promoting Ali's fights. Go figure, huh? Go figure. Uh, so it gets really, really bad. It got bad enough. I'm going to let you folks in on another thing that doesn't you never hear in the media on anything about Sonny Liston, uh, Floyd Patterson. Uh, or Muhammad Ali with concerns to Muhammad Ali getting stripped of the the titles, the two belts, uh, the newly created WBC and the old standard WBA belt. Uh, there was a lot of talk back then when Ali got drafted that they did it uh, as a punishment. Uh, the FBI finagling with the uh, DOD, the Department of Defense, and they made sure his number, Ali's number, came up. And it wasn't because of speaking against the war. It wasn't because, because Ali wasn't vocal against no war till he got drafted. See, isn't that funny how that works? He's a Lip sealed, and then he gets drafted, and then all of a sudden it's an issue, see. Uh, and, and we're never told this stuff. We're never told truths about anybody, hardly. And so, uh, he got drafted. He didn't go. It appealed in court, both the WBA and the WBC, I believe. I believe the WBA stripped him first. And then later the WBC stripped him. If I'm not mistaken, that's how that worked. I don't think they both did it at one time. So, and then nobody would license a fight with uh, with Ali. And we'll talk about Ali's first stand as a fighter. Ali fought like uh, 
the big name uh, Cleveland, the big cat Williams. But see, there was a problem there. Cleveland Williams had uh, been shot by a policeman and had a portion of his liver removed and a kidney removed uh, a little over a year before I leave on him. So that's one of the things. I could go on and go down through the line of who he fought the first time. Now, uh, he did he did fight Floyd Patterson the first time. Uh, so I, I'm not demeaning. I'm, I, and, and really, this is not on my league. This is on the Dundees. So if you want to get on somebody, it, getting on my league is not the one to get on it. Be to get on the Dundees about this. And we're going to see how this dirty, rotten pile of feces ended up rolling over into Don King. So they got the title from him. Uh, a friend of uh, someone from Louisville, Kentucky, who was actually, I believe, went to the same school as Muhammad Ali, uh, the same primary school. God, and I can't think of the guy's name. But he got the WBC or B WBA bail, and uh, he was friends with Ali. And he won that. He was a pretty good boxer himself. I'm not taking anything away from the guy. But he was no Muhammad Ali or Floyd Patterson or Joe Frazier or anything like that. As a matter of fact, he fought Joe Frazier and that unified the belts, and then Joe Frazier was the uh, undisputed champion. So, but then you go through, you get through all of that, and then you pop up, and the finagling's done, and Don King's in the door. The Dundees and their, the company that they were using, and some say it was two or three companies, once they started going after uh, his brother for the conflict of interest there during all these fights and the uh, Angelo Dundee's fighters happen happening to win all these fights uh, Pretty remarkable, huh? Isn't that amazing? Even if you look at boxing today, not hard to figure out Same stuff's going on just in a little bit of different ways uh, So it rolls over uh, you, I'm going to skip a big chunk of history here, but we're going to get on something else with Don King in it now. But Angelo Dundee's brother is still in it, which means Angelo Dundee is still in it, which means the Mafia is still in it. You have the fight down in Africa. You got uh, George Foreman's holding the title. Uh, rightfully so, he won it. Uh, and it was rightfully so when Ali had it because he won it. See, so I'm not saying that. Uh, but there was some finagling going on. We all knew it at the time. Uh, they've got George Foreman so mixed up in his old head. Uh, he denies everything that he originally said with about cheating that went on. And there was cheating that went on. And the biggest, uh, there were several things, but I'm going to touch on one. The biggest thing, you go look at that fight. And you look at other Ali fights, it is amazing that Ali could go on the ropes and lean back so far on the ropes to where somebody would have to hit him and the bottom rope would be the bottom rope would be here and his head would be over here. And you couldn't hit him. And you would reach over. He could lean back that far. You could be standing there and he could lean back so far you couldn't get him with a one-two. Or you'd be on him and you'd both flip out of the ring. The damn ropes were loosened in a plethora. I mean, not plethora, because he didn't have a plethora of fights, but in a, a lot of Muhammad Ali fights. And uh, that should have never happened. Uh, I, don't, I don't know where it's sitting today, but those ropes were regulated in yesteryear. And they had to have a certain tension on them from state to state. And uh, one thing uh, that you didn't see in uh, Fraser Ali 1, uh, you didn't see this, 
was those loose ropes that he could lean back on those ropes. But after Frazier Ali won, you start looking at Ali's fights. After Ali lost, lost trying to get the title back a second time to Joe Frazier, all of a sudden Ali's doing the lean back thing and he's got ropes that'll lean back with him. See, uh, there's another thing we're going to talk about Muhammad Ali. Uh, I, I don't think Muhammad Ali maybe didn't even know none of this crap was going on. Number one, Muhammad Ali was really, really not a very intuitive fella in that, uh, I'll say, inclined to know what was going on around. He had a lot of clever thoughts, but you go back to, you know, he went to Harvard. And they're, oh, wow. And all he says is, God loves you, so you should try to do, do good for God. God's there. T try to talk to him. And, and all these intellectuals, oh. And the only reason they did that, because he was anti-war. It wasn't nothing intellectual about Muhammad Ali. You know, go back and look. You know, he's doing sit-ups. I've done 1,345 calisthenics today. You know, that just wasn't... I'm not putting Ali down, and I wasn't putting Sonny Liston down, because Ali could read and write, and he was an intelligent guy. But I'm just saying, I don't think he was intelligent enough to... You could have pulled this right by him. So what I'm doing is really defending Ali here. I think a lot of things happened to favor Ali. But I think who really got favored was not Ali. And I don't think Ali knew about all the mess that was going on to benefit Ali, that it really didn't benefit Ali. It benefited the Dundees and then later on Don King, who in turn benefited back the Dundees. So that, that was the whole relationship there. How in the world a convicted murderer comes up and just all of a sudden in the click of a hand is the biggest promoter, boxing promoter in the world. It was because it was relinquished by those Dundee people, They're totally mafia controlled, and I believe it was never really relinquished, and I'm not sure it's relinquished today, and Don King was installed as a front man. Had a big enough mouth, made, they made everybody hate him, even fighters, and truth be known, the money Don King got was just skimming off the fighters and the rest of it probably went to the mob. I don't know. That's what we were all saying uh, while all this mess was going on. And that's what none of you get to hear. So that's why I've brought up a lot of this. And uh, you guys complain about boxing today, but we were complaining about it yesteryear and yesterdecade. Uh, trust me on that. Were there better fights yesteryear and yester decade? Yes. It's very rare we had a quitter. Uh, maybe six to seven out of ten champions today, if they are put to extreme bear, we'll just quit. We'll just quit. Uh, possibly with the exclusion of two or three heavyweights, in the top 15, uh, and I'll name two of them right off the hand. Deontay Wilder's not going to quit. You're going to have to beat him to death, and Tyson Fury. There's a couple of more than them. I, I'm not going to name them, but the rest of that pack, shit, they'd quit. And the other weight divisions are very similar to that. They may have a few more that wouldn't quit, but uh, it's just lined up with quitters. Oh, I got sucked in the eye. You know, really? Oh, you know, just think about this. Somebody gets their jaw broke, they're quit. You know, you go back uh, between rounds, they pull your mouthpiece out and the tooth comes out with it, they'll quit. So we, we did have a lot better of a boxing, but you, you younger people today, it's just you look at the finagling, I'm an old man. I've seen the finagling all along. Uh, they'll put it right up in national television in front of you. And uh, because the announcers aren't doing the bitching and griping, everybody says, well, it must be okay. And a lot of us were too. But most of us uh, that were within 
had friends within, uh, boxed ourselves or whatever, uh, everybody. I mean, it was the gym topic of the days. What in the hell? You know, this guy was leaning into Idaho when he was leaning up on those ropes. George Foreman's right. They did cheat. And there was about four or five other things that Foreman said, too. But, of course, when the political tides turned and the people's tides turned and they started loving Ali so much for the anti-war stance and, and some other and good things that Ali did, uh, then George Foreman jumped on that camp, too. And then Ali got hurt and he got sick. And it's not good to go uh, bash, you know, jumping on a sick fella. That's, I mean, and who would want to do that? Uh, but we were all talking about these things. And uh, the people that were talking about it, about it all the way through the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden at some point in the 80s, just made up the story that everything they said they never said and it was all peachy king so word to the wise uh your history is skewed in the in the books and your boxing history is skewed as well so uh history has been politicized and skewed to fit certain narratives for certain groups or certain people and boxing has been uh, skewed uh, to the same things and all of you better start to realize that I don't care who this is made man I know what everybody was talking about uh, in the 60s and 70s and 80s or, or the 60s and 70s uh, and and the early to mid 80s I mean I know what tell everybody was saying we were all saying the same damn thing Everybody was. Now, you may have been six years old and playing uh, uh, backyard football or something, and the topic of boxing come up, and you may have said something different. And, uh, but I'm telling you, everybody in boxing was, there was the same theme, theme, and we were all saying the same damn things. We knew it. It was an open secret. We were like, these sons of bitches. Uh, and so it changed hands and it, the finale in my lifetime was Don King that's who it went to and he was the front guy the guy with a big mouth and uh, so we got a lot of dogs barking out here for some reason but much love to everybody wake up dig for truth and everything that you look at uh if anybody's got any questions, put them down there. Uh, if you disagree with me, put it down there because I may have misspoke something. Uh, uh, I may have gave a wrong name here or there or something like that or maybe mixed a date up or something of that nature. But in the entirety of this, this is what we all were thinking. And the problem with me is... I've continued to think it. I'm thinking what I thunk. And I haven't changed, but this, the, everybody's been like in the book Ecclesiastes and the Bible and it's just turned and changed. And I'm still remembering all this stuff and I refuse to block it out and I don't give a damn whether Teddy Atlas or uh, whoever, Mike Tyson or John Fury or I don't care if everybody hates me says you're wrong that to hell with them I know how it was I know what we were all thinking I know what we all knew and I know what we all saw and I know what we all heard on a, a many plethora of different programs that were on national television at the time and uh, cable outlets later that we're talking about all this stuff. As it happened, we knew that it was finagling going on. So, I just felt the need to get that off my brain. There's four or five other things I was going to bring up. I know I forgot to bring them up, but uh, much love to everybody out there. I hope everybody has a great, great week.